not going to do each and every chapter in the book of Psalms because there's 150 chapters. Uh, so whenever it comes to Psalms and Proverbs, we're going to be a little selective, but you guys know me. The difficult places, the places that most people wouldn't want to teach on, that's what we're going to be studying. So we're going to make sure that we hit the difficult parts. We're going to make sure that we hit the parts that will really make a difference. And then some Psalms are repetitive. Some Psalms, you know, we, may not, we might not need to spend an entire week studying. You know, but every place that could possibly cause confusion, every part that is just beautifully instructive as far as uh, prophecy goes, as far as instruction goes, that's what we're going to be studying. And so I'm very excited that here we are. Well, the book of Psalms, chapter 1, a little intro will do. The book of Psalms just means praises. That's, that's what the book of Psalms means. It means praises. And it just so happens that the subject of each psalm is Yahweh Elohim. You can pick it, you can put your finger and pick any psalm in in the book of Psalms, and you're gonna find that each and every one of them, the subject of each psalm is Yahweh Elohim. And if you do a study, and I hope you count, because I had to, because sometimes it's, it's hard to use the actual concordance because they tell you how many verses you find it in, but you have to go counting them one by one. If you count the number of times that Yahweh is mentioned by name in the book of Psalms, guess how many times it is? Count it for yourself. 777 times. That is 777. That's 21. You have them all up. That's, that's the Trinity. That's 777, the perfect number. The book of Psalms is an amazing book, 150 Psalms, five books. It's divided for a reason, for a very special reason, into five sections. As you're going through the book of Psalms, and I hope that as we go, you're reading all the Psalms. Many of them are very, very short. Some psalms can be read probably in 15 to 20 seconds. They're very short. Um, some are longer, like the Psalm 119. But it's broken into five books. Whenever you go through the Bible, you're going to notice that it says book one. And then you'll have you know, quite a few psalms, usually around 40. And then all of a sudden, it'll say book two, because they were divided that way from the beginning. They're, they're divided by the Holy Spirit into five different books. 2,461 verses in the book of Psalms. 42,704 words in the book of Psalms in the Hebrew. Uh, I didn't count the Spanish or the English because it's going to be different. Translation will add or subtract. But in the, in the Hebrew, 42,704 um, words, which is an interesting number there if you want to play around with them. Seven human authors, but of course all written by the Holy Spirit. And if you read from Psalm 1 to Psalm 150, if you're an average speed reader, it'll take you about five hours to read the book of Psalms. About an hour per book to get through uh, the book of Psalms. Interesting things that I like to take note of and that I like to uh, reference. More than half of the Old Testament citations, whenever the, when, whenever the New Testament cites from the Old Testament, whenever it refers to or alludes to the Old Testament, over half of the Old Testament citations found in the New Testament are from the Psalms. Is the book of Psalms important? I think yes. so. If over half of the quotes or allusions or references made the New Testament to the Old Testament, if over half of them come from the Psalms, wow. wow. That, must, that must be very heavy on the heart of God. It's his book of praises. The, the Psalter, as they call it, is the book of praises of Yahweh. There are 103 psalm citations or references or allusions in the book of Revelation alone. The fun part for you would be to track them down. Mm. Track those down if you can. Uh, you have 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. As you're reading, look through, and if anything sounds familiar, make a reference. Or as we're going through the psalms, as we go through the psalms, and as you're reading in your private time all 150 psalms, whenever you read something that strikes a bell or says, whoa, that reminds me of something I read in Revelation. Find it in Revelation, make yourself a reference, and you're going to see what I'm telling you. There are 149 psalm citations, or references or allusions, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 149. It just so happens that, in a, certain, in a kind of technical kind of way, Yahshua begins his ministry quoting or acting out a psalm. In John 2.17, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he, he, uh, there's a quote of the Psalms, the zeal of your house has consumed me. What happened in John chapter 2? It was the first time he cleared the temple, whenever he made himself the scourge, and, and, he, and he, for the first time, he did it once at the beginning of his ministry, once at the end of his ministry, whenever he cleared the temple of the people. So he begins his ministry in Psalms, and then Yahshua also concludes his ministry in Luke 23, 46, with Psalm 31, 5, into your hands I commend my spirit. So how important are the Psalms? I would say very important. If Jesus is acting these things out and he's, 
quoting them at the beginning and end and all throughout his ministry, I'd say it's very important. Now, the author of each psalm is also Yahweh Elohim. He's not only the subject, but he's also the author, the Holy Spirit. But of course, Yahweh works through human instruments. So even though he uses our hand to write the books, it is the Holy Spirit who is the author. Uh, Peter is very clear whenever he tells us that the Holy Spirit moved the hand. We, I love reading in Daniel whenever he finished, Hi Sherry, come on in. Whenever I noticed that David had to lay in bed sick for days because he received the prophecy, he received the vision, and whenever he reread what he had written, he laid in bed sick for days. Why? He didn't understand it. He said that no one around him understood. That's what he said. He said no one understood what was going on. He didn't understand what was going on. Whenever he says no one understood it, he's including himself. So it's an amazing thing, human authors. So even though the human hand is what's being used, and the human personality is being used, every jot, every tittle, every word, every line is by Yahweh's authorship. King David wrote 76. Now, someone in here might say, hmm, 76, I've always heard 73. Uh, if you're ever studying this kind of thing, the typical answer will be that 73 psalms were written by David. And, and I know a few of you are probably thinking that. You're thinking, hmm, he might be wrong there because I think it's 73. Here's the thing. Here's what most of the scholars, they always stop short. They never go the extra mile. If, if they never give David credit for Acts chapter 2, I mean, I'm sorry, for Psalm 2, yet in Acts 4.25, Peter tells us that it was David who wrote it. Peter tells us. In, uh, in Acts 4.25, he tells us that it was David who wrote that psalm. So the psalm itself doesn't say that David wrote it, no. But later, the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to tell us that it was David who wrote it. So David gets credit with Psalm number 2. In Psalm 72, they never give David credit for that one either. Yet, if you look at the last verse, Psalm 72.20, guess who it says wrote it? Usually in the psalm it says, a psalm of David. And whenever they go through and they make their notes, they look at the very opening headline, because most of the psalms have like a little opening headline uh, before the actual psalm comes in. If, they'd sim if they simply would have gone to the end of the psalm, you'll notice that it gives David credit for the authorship. So that one is also a, a Davidic psalm. Then Psalm 95. They never give credit to David for Psalm 95, yet go to Hebrews 4, 7, and guess who it says wrote it? David. So David gets credit for those three. So yeah, in most of your commentaries and most of your sources where people go, David always gets credit for 73. Yeah, but I'm here to tell you, here's your proof that he wrote 76. He wrote 76 of the Psalms. Okay, Asaph, a Levite, worship director, he wrote 12 Psalms. The sons of Korah wrote 11 Psalms. He-man. He-man. <laughs> he wrote one Psalm. Solomon wrote two Psalms. Good old Moses wrote one psalm. Ethan the Ezraite wrote one psalm. And then there were 46, number 10. Remember that number 10 wow. is going to come into play here. 10 are anonymous, yet it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter if we don't know which human instrument was used because who truly is the author of the psalms? The Holy Spirit. So it doesn't matter to me if we know who wrote it or not. The fact is God saw that its inclusion was necessary. Here are the divisions, and if you look in your Bibles, you'll probably see that just before Psalm 42, it's going to say book 2. Just before Psalm 73, it'll say book 3. Almost every single Bible, except for like maybe the, the giveaway Bibles that have no headings, no nothing in them, besides those Bibles that have no little things added in there, um, those might be the only ones that don't have it, but in just about every Bible that gives you a little bit more than just the, the, the plain text itself, um, you're going to see these divisions in the Psalms. They're divided into five, and here's the thing. Whenever I was confounded by this a long time ago, and I, and I kept reading section by section, and I just delve into each section of the Psalms, a pattern starts to come out that you start to realize. You see a shift in focus every time you shift from these different divisions, from, uh, from the book 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I'm going to give you, as we reach these milestones, I'm going to give you the next one, and we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to show you why. Um, I believe there's a huge reason, and this is kind of the discovery that was very interesting to me. I believe the reason the Psalms are broken into five different divisions is because at the time whenever David was writing the Psalms, what was the main packet of the Bible that everyone read? The Torah? The Pentateuch? 
the books of, of Moses, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, those are the ones that everybody was reading. Now, with that being said, I believe David, or well, the Holy Spirit, not David, but I believe the Holy Spirit broke the Psalms into five different books, and then you start to realize the theme and the thematics of each different book, and you realize that it goes hand in hand with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They are divided perfectly in order by book. Now, Yahweh is the subject of each and every psalm. He's the subject of the entire Bible, if you want to get more specific. Um, but if you had to say, Yahweh is the subject, but what is the secondary emphasis on? Well, in Genesis, what was the pinnacle of God's creation? Man. 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 Who was it that God created in his image? <coughs> and who becomes the emphasis in the book of Genesis? The unfolding story of mankind on the earth. Well, it just so happens, whenever you're reading Psalms 1 through 41, you're going to notice that man is the secondary emphasis. Everything has to do with man. Now, I can't go through, I'm not going to go, I could, but we'd be here for a long time. We can go through each and every Psalm 1 through 41 and show you how many times man is mentioned. Let me give you a couple of the highlights. Psalm 1, tonight, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalm 8, we'll just kind of jump around. Who is man that you are mindful of him? Psalm 14, 2, Yahweh looked down from heaven on the children of men. Uh, Psalm 31, 12, I am forgotten, out of mind, like a dead man. I am a broken vessel. Uh, Psalm 31, 20, you will hide those who fear you from the pride of man in the secrecy of your presence. Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Wow, there's a gospel presentation for you. Uh, 37, 16, the little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of a multitude of wicked men. So two different times. You see the emphasis, and I'm just giving you a couple mountaintops. You go through the entire section of Psalm 1 through 41 on your own, and you're going to notice that there's a, an emphasis on mankind. Okay, and finally, a good man's steps are directed by Yahweh, and he delights in his walk. 39.5, you made my days like but a handbreadth. My age is nothing before you. Truly, every man at his very best is utter futility. <laughs> There's truth for you. Number 1040. Blessed is the man who puts his trust in Yahweh, who does not respect the proud, nor those who go astray following lies. Wow. The truth we find in the Psalms. Just a, just a few uh, mountaintops. Now, speaking of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, speaking of the Torah, speaking of the first five books of Moses, the most venerated books to the Jew, to us, the Christian, every single book is venerated. Every single book is equally as important as any other. There are 66 books in the Bible. We love each and every one of them. They are equally inspired. They are equally instructive. We need them all. But to the Jew, what are the most venerated books in the Bible? The Pentateuch, the Torah. Okay, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Just as the book of Psalms has Yahweh as at its center. It has Yahweh not only in, it as the center subject and theme of the central chapters and verses of Psalms, which I've shown you other times. We'll get to it whenever we get to that chapter. We'll look at that again. Um, it's an amazing thing that David may have gotten that idea, or the Holy Spirit is actually giving us a repetition whenever we get to the book of Psalms that he had already given us in the actual Pentateuch that the Psalms are modeled after. Let me show you what I mean. In Psalms, Yahweh is the subject. He's the theme. He's the central figure in every single psalm. But the true, that's, that, that's also true of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the, the Pentateuch, the Torah. Um, there's something that the Jews have known about for a long time, and that some people, there's no denying that it's there. Uh, that's quantitative. You can see it, it's there. Uh, I, I, I check these things out on my own. There is no doubting that the Bible code exists. That's not up for dispute. It's not disputable. It's undisputable, why? Because they're there. You can actually, you can download yourself a copy of the Mesoretic text. How do you do Bible codes? People ask me this question and I give them this answer, then they get mad at me because they think it's gonna be a simpler answer, but this is how you do it. You wanna check out Bible codes for yourself, this is what you have to do. Download for yourself a free copy of the Mesoretic text. There are 5,000 copies of it that survive in different stages of fragments and, and whole scrolls, and they all agree. You have some punctuation difference, but they all agree. It, it, God preserved his word. Um, that's the reason you don't see much change between the translations and the Old Testament, because the Old Testament was preserved so well by the miseries. Um, over 5,000 copies. It is the most documented 
uh, we can be sure that our Old Testament and our New Testament are exactly as Yahweh wanted us to have them. Especially the Old Testament. And that's a different story for a different day. But you have to download a copy of the Masoretic Text. It won't cost you a thing. It's free. Then buy yourself a Bible Codes book. There are hundreds of them. There are hundreds. Buy yourself a Bible Codes book where it purports to tell you where these Bible Codes are. Get yourself one, two, three, ten, a hundred of these books. Look in there and see what they're claiming is hidden within the Hebraic Scripture. Then you look at what they're telling you. You go in and you count the numbers. You count the numbers. You circle the letter. And then you plug those letters into your Hebraic Dictionary and you see if the word comes back. If it tells you the truth, you're going to know. If it didn't tell you the truth, if it's just false or a, or a farce, you're going to know. So that's what you have to do to corroborate these Bible codes. That's, that's what I do. That's what I recommend everyone to do. It's the only way that you can. I'm going to show you an example of a Bible code that I made up myself. Okay, uh, Here's a sentence. Love to golf? Try opening day. Cart is always free. I wrote that probably 10 years ago now, maybe more, and it took me like 45 minutes. That was one of the hardest sentences I've ever written in my life. It took me so long. Uh, love to golf, try opening day, car is always free. An, an equidistant letter search means that the Holy Spirit has hidden information under the plain text by equally spaced letters. Yet everything in the plain text makes perfect sense. Kind of like this sentence makes sense. Yet what is underneath it? Um, if, what's, the, what's, the most, what's the best number in the Bible? What, what's God's number? Seven. seven. Let's go to the seventh number, or the seventh letter, I mean, G, right? Seven letters after that, O. Seven letters after that, D. Seven hmm. letters after that, I. Seven letters after that, S. What do you get? God is. Okay, that took me like 45 minutes. That, that was one of the <laughs> hardest things I've ever done. And then, but by making this up, by making up this sentence, it gave me more awe for the fact that there are Bible codes on every single page of the Bible. You have hidden messages. And here's the thing, it's not like cat, me, mm -hmm. you, him, God. It's not little tiny words. You have messages, you have, and the words that it's talking about explain the section of the Bible that it's under. Which, whenever we, especially whenever we get to Isaiah, we'll see a lot more of that. And we, we did a lot of that in the book of Genesis and uh, the book of Ruth. Okay, let's see what's hidden, knowing that Yahweh is the center of all things, and that he's the center of the book of Psalms, and the Psalms is a mere image of the Pentateuch. Let's see what we find. T-O-R-H, you read from right to left in the Hebrew, so you read from right to left, that says Torah, uh, it means the law, it, it, it really means the teaching, it means the teaching, that's what it means, but you know, we translate it in English as the law, okay, but it's the teaching. Uh, 219 times the law, the Torah, is found. That word, Torah, is found 219 times. If you add that up, that's 12. That's the kingdom, right? Uh, so the law. Now, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That is the Pentateuch. The Jewish rabbis, they started counting whenever they made the discovery that these Bible codes were there. And, they, and then they started using computers when, when the time came to actually search for these hidden codes. And that's where this came out of. They noticed that if they went and they looked for the very first T that they could find in Genesis, they went to the very first T, and at a distance of 49 spaces, 49 letters, just like we did 777 with the Love Golf and all that, um, they went, they found the first T, then they counted 49 letters, and they counted 49 letters, and they counted 49 letters, and it gave them the word Torah. Hmm. Well, okay, great, fantastic. All right, no big deal. Maybe it's a coincidence, right? You're going to get to the point in the Bible to where there are a lot of coincidences. You, you finally get to the point in the Bible to where you say, I don't think any of this is a coincidence. I think every bit of this is here by deliberate design. And that is the joy of studying the Bible. Whenever you realize that we hold in our hands an extraterrestrial source of knowledge and perfection and truth leading us to our Creator. That's the joy of studying the Bible when you realize what it is you have in your hands. When you realize that this is, a, this is an encoded messaging system from outside our time domain that was given to us here on this planet, transmitted through us into our languages, yet perfect in its transmission, which leads us to our creator, 
and he is outside of our time domain because he sees the end as clearly as he sees the past and the present. If the word of God is exactly what it claims to be, the word of God, that should change everything about our lives. That should change the way we view ourselves. That should change the way we view others. That should change the way we view our pilgrimage on this earth. That should change the way we view the future. Knowing that the word of God is the word of God. We should follow it. We should know it. We should respect it. We should fear it. Then they went to Exodus. And they said, what if? Could it be? Is it possible? They looked for the first T. And then they counted 49, 49, 49, 49. And guess what they came up with? Hmm. Torah. The same thing in the second book. They're like, hmm, once? Okay, that's nifty. <laughs> Twice? What are, the, what are the chances of that happening accidentally? What are the chances of that just happening on its own? And I'm telling you right now, what are the chances of them making it happen, the Jews, whenever they're writing the book? I know how hard it was just to write one sentence. There are Bible codes covering the book everywhere. It is an impossibility that a human being invented the Bible. They say it's just one book of many. No, no, no. It's the book of all books. It is the only book that actually matters. It is the Word of God. So guess what? They went to the book of Leviticus, and they said, what if they found the first T, they counted 49, it wasn't there. Dun, 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 dun. It wasn't there. Thanks for playing. Sorry, sorry for your luck, you know. So they said, well, isn't that awful? So they said, well, maybe it was just a really nifty coincidence after all. But then they, then they ran the program in reverse, which they do because the Bible codes are found forward and reverse. Whenever they, went, whenever they started with Deuteronomy, being the, the Pentateuch, guess what happened? In reverse, they found the first T, and then they counted 49, 49, 49, 49. And in reverse, at the same equidistant letter, but in reverse, they found Torah again. <laughs> but in reverse. And they said, that is just weird. They said, what if we go to Numbers and it's the same way? They went to Numbers, they started backwards, they found the first T, counted 49, 49, 49, 49, and guess what they found? Torah backwards again. And then they said, well, we already checked Leviticus, let's check it backwards, wasn't there. They checked it forwards again, wasn't there. And they said, this, there can't be a broken code. If this is God's word, if he started a code, a sequence like this, he'd have to finish it. Well, finally, guess what they did? They started using other numbers. What is the square root? What is the root of 49? Seven. Seven times seven is 49. What is the root of the law, the word of God? Yahweh. So guess what they did? Going forward, they found the first Yod. The name of Yahweh is yod heh vav -Heh. They found the first Yod. They counted seven, 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 and they found the name Yahweh. It turns out that all five books of the Torah point to Yahweh. Just as the book of Psalms points to Yahweh. Just as the book of Psalms points toward the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. In the first five books of the Bible, all five books point to. And what is the book of the law in the Pentateuch? Leviticus. Isn't that something? You have Genesis, which just means beginnings. You have Exodus, which is, you know, a, a going out. You have Numbers, which is the census, count, the counting of Israel. You have Deuteronomy, which is the giving the second time of the law. Deuteronomy just means the, the second time giving of the law. But what does Leviticus mean? That's the book of the law. So right there in the book of the law, you have Yahweh. All five books of the Torah point toward Yahweh. Yahweh being the root of the law, of his word. Now the law, his statutes, his commandments, all of that are euphemisms for his word in general. Do we only focus on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then throw the rest of it away? No, no, no. no. Whenever we say the law, whenever we say the teaching, the Torah, even though it, it, it stands for the first five books, guess what to the Christian God's law and word is? It's the entire Bible. That is, that is what we're interested in. Now, speaking of the law, whenever you think of commandments, how many are there? Ten, right? You have ten commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments happen to be the ten subdivisions for the larger body of the law. How many laws are there in total? 613, right? So here we have 613 commandments in all, all subdivided under the Ten Commandments. Now, what is 6 plus 1 plus 3? 
10, right? 10, of course, being the number of human responsibility. Now, let's switch that 6, 1, 3 around. Let's actually switch it around. What do you get? 316. Where was God's law fulfilled? John 3.16, wasn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The fulfillment of the law for us is John 3.16, and 3.16, of course, is another 10. Now, speaking of fulfilling the law, John 6.3.16 John 6, 3, 3, is a wonderful verse of the fulfillment of God's purpose and plan for us. It's the gospel in one verse. Jesus uses the word, Plato, Plato is like P-L-E-R-O-O. -O. There's two O's. Pla you could say Plato, but they pronounce it Plato. Pla not Plato, but Plato. Plato is the word for, for fulfill. That's how you write it in the Greek. The word to fulfill is Plato. And you find that ten times. Jesus says that word ten times. You have a concordance, you can look it up. Ten times Jesus uses that word fulfill. Jesus performs 37 miracles to substantiate his ministry. What's 7 plus 3? 10. In Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, is the book most quoted by Jesus. There's no other book of the Bible that Jesus quotes more than the book of Deuteronomy. And he happens to quote Deuteronomy 46 times. What's 4 plus 6? These are the strange structures that are found all over the Bible, depending on the book that you're in. Whatever the message may be from God to us, that's what you end up finding. Now, the Psalms, the book of Psalms, is based on the Pentateuch, the, the, the most venerated books of the Bible. What does Jesus himself happen to say about the Psalms? Does he substantiate them? Well, I think we've already gone over that. But let's look at something a little bit more direct. Uh, something that Jesus told us. Then Yahshua said, Everything I told you while I was still with you, everything prophesied in the law of Moses, and the prophets, and in the Psalms. Did Yahshua just let the cat out of the bag and let us know that the Psalms are not just songs, they're not just praises, they're not just times of worship, the Psalms are prophetic. The Psalms are some of the most intense and deep prophecies in the entire Bible, and Jesus is the one who told us about that. Everything I told you, Everything I told you while I was still with you, everything prophesied in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, and truly, that encompasses the entire Old Testament. What does Jesus say? The volume of the book is written of me. The volume of the book. What did he say? You people put your trust in Moses, and yet Moses wrote of me. Everything prophesied in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. So we find Yahshua all throughout the Old Testament. I think that's one of the major themes of this Bible study, isn't it? Every time we go through, and I think that's the reason we enjoy the Old Testament so much, because there are too many people that don't get anything out of the Old Testament because they haven't been trained to see Yahshua on every page. And I think that's what we do in here. We train ourselves to see Yahshua on every single page because he told us that he's there. So if he himself told us that he's there, it doesn't matter if we're studying the Old Testament or the New Testament. Guess who we're going to find? Yahshua. That's who we're going to find. Then he opened their understanding so that they might understand the scriptures. And that's the purpose of a Bible study just like this. That through the Holy Spirit, our understanding might be open so that we can understand the scriptures. Knowing that Yahshua himself said that he's on every single page. The volume of the book is written of me. Moses wrote of me. The, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. He opened their understanding so that they might understand the scriptures. So with that being said, here is Psalm 1, just the entire thing. It's only six verses. So with that foundation, here we are in Psalm 1, and we're just going to read it. There's your title, which most Psalms have, The Way of the Righteous and the Wicked. Verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who neither walks in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But, here comes the contrast, but whose delight is in the law of Yahweh, and who meditates on his law day and night. Now, we as Christians, whenever we see the word law, statute, commandment, um, ordinance. 
whatever it may be, we can say in our minds, he's talking about the entire word of God. He's not talking about the 613 laws. If you think that he's only talking about the 613 laws, then we can throw the rest of the Bible except Leviticus away. All we need is Leviticus. And I think we see the fallacy there, don't we? Whenever he says law, commandments, ordinances, statutes, it's their euphemisms. He uses them almost interchangeably throughout the Psalms to be a euphemism for his word. We could read this, but whose delight is in the word of Yahweh and who meditates on his word day and night. Day and night. He will be this person who doesn't go the bad way, but he goes the right way. There's only one right way, and that's Jesus Christ. He will be like a tree. Aren't we trees? Yeah. How many times have we gone through yeah. that? We're all we're trees. We're God's agriculture. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Whenever you have a river of water, what is a tree going to get? Nutrients. nutrients. He's going to get water. He's going to be sucking up the, the, the food, the nutrients, the water. Trees have the, the two uh, tubes. They have the, the xylem and the phloem. Uh, the xylem is where the water gets sucked up. The, the food is where the, the, the phloem is where the food gets sucked up. You can say the xylem and the phloem. Xylem is water. Phloem starts with an F. It's for food. So the tree is going to suck up the nutrients to, to give itself nutrients to grow. If you have healthy roots, you're gonna have healthy bark. You're gonna have, not the dog, but the tree. You're gonna have healthy branches. You're gonna have healthy leaves. You're gonna be bearing fruit. Guess what the man of God is who delights in the word of Yahweh, who meditates on the word of Yahweh day and night? Guess what? He's not only gonna be like a tree, he's gonna be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in a season. His leaves, the beautiful leaves that suck in what's around him to release the oxygen that others need to breathe. Whenever a Christian comes around, we offer a fresh breath, just like a tree, don't we? A tree sucks in the carbon dioxide, and what it sends back out is oxygen that people need to breathe. That's what a Christian needs to do. We need to suck in the wonderful word of God, and then we need to emit what everyone else needs so that they can breathe, and so that they can live, and so that they can grow, and it's all by the word of God. A deep breath. A, take a deep breath, everybody. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in the season. His leaves will not wither. <laughs> we need to be ready in season, out of season. Amen. We're here to give oxygen. We're here to give a fresh, fresh breath of Jesus Christ wherever we go all the time. All the time. That brings forth his fruit in season. His leaves will not wither. And whatever he does will prosper. Praise God. Praise God. Verse 4 and 5. The ungodly are not like that. <laughs> Pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> the ungodly are not like that. They're like the chaff blown away by the wind. What part do you discard? The chaff. It's, it's the grain that you keep. It's the wheat that you keep. 